I know it, it feels kind of late to say that, but it would be very strange to start our first talk BD of 2021 without wishing you a new year. Because last year was a rough year and it is a new year. Uh, so good to be here again. Welcome to everybody who is on the line. I'm Erin Mahalik. Um, I'm the, la the founder and leader of uh, Crest BD. Many of you are going to be familiar with our group because you will have been joining these events um, that we held right the way through 2021. But um, I can see that there are a bunch of new people joining us today as well who I don't recognize. And so let's just tell you that uh, Crest BD is, um, you know, our, foot our footprint is in Canada. You know, our physical home is, is in Canada, but we're really an international network that specializes in uh, research in bipolar disorder in helping um, really optimize health and quality of life in people with bipolar disorder and doing research hand in hand with people who live with a condition. Um, and it is uh, really our, our pleasure to be joining you. Um, let me tell you a bit about the history of these events. Um, the first one we held was in March, um, just after the pandemic began. Um, we thought at the time quite carefully about the best type of support that we could provide to our community um, through Crest and decided at that point that um, this Talk BD series would be it. You're going to notice that this is not kind of a classic scientific academic webinar series. Um, we have a mix of speakers usually, sometimes they're researchers, sometimes they're clinicians. There are always people with bipolar disorder involved as speakers um, and the topics for the events are picked by our community, but we very intentionally keep them light on PowerPoint. We'll give you some resources at the end and you'll have a resource document provided to you as we go through this. Um, but we really wanted to kind of try and do our best to create a bit more of an intimate gathering space to focus on some of the issues that people were facing internationally uh, during COVID-19. So um, with that, that was, uh, you know, one of the reasons we picked the topic for today, resilience um, and what kept us resilient last year. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Um, but before we do that, and before we go into introductions, let me give you some kind of housekeeping stuff for those of you who haven't done one of these events before. Um, we take questions um, in all kinds of ways, um, just not audio questions. You have had the opportunity perhaps to provide them through the survey on our website before this event. We can take them through Facebook. You can type them anonymously if you're joining us through Zoom into the chat box. Um, and then we have one of our team members, Laura, is coordinating all of those. So however you want to give us our questions, we'll then answer them verbally at the end. Um, and uh, yeah, I think mostly that's it for housekeeping. I probably forgot a couple of things, but I'll, I'll remember them later on. I want to begin with uh, some introductions, I think. Um, and we'll start perhaps with, with Victoria. I was, you know, if we, if we thought about our, uh, our relationship in terms of like dating terms, Victoria, I, I would have to think we'd be at least beyond going steady. We're almost kind of like marriage or in a long-term <laughs> partnership at this point. It's been 15, yeah, 15 yeah, we're almost like a, an, yeah, I, uh, I'd say sort of one of those old cranky couples almost. <laughs> I mean, we have other partners. We're not, you know, we're, it's not just us. <laughs> that we just, just doesn't people. sound right. <laughs> pretty long, yeah, it does. But it's a pretty long-term relationship at this point, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tell us a bit about yourself, Victoria. Sure. Um, those of you who have joined us before know a bit about my background, but for those of you who are new, um, I am Victoria uh, Maxwell, and I was diagnosed a long time ago with bipolar disorder with psychosis, rapid cycling, bipolar one actually, also with anxiety and uh, um, uh, like I said, psychosis. Um, and it took me a long time to accept the diagnosis, um, five years in and out of the hospital. Uh, and then once I finally did, it was still a long uh, recovery journey. Um, and that my recoveries included medication, psychotherapy, all the kind of wellness tools that most of you are probably familiar with. Uh, and then I uh, met Aaron and um, we met uh, through a research study uh, and then she started Crest BD and I was invited to be part of it. And so I was really excited because I really found that uh, the focus really is on the ex lived experience of people as um, the driving force of what's behind the research, which I think makes it much more meaningful and relevant to us. 
Um, and so I've been working with them on and off uh, since it began. Uh, on my sort of work life, I'm a keynote speaker and an actor. I perform uh, one person shows about my experience uh, at conferences. Uh, and that's about it. I, I'll, I'll pass it on or back to you, Erin. Thanks, Victoria. Um, and then Alessandra Torresani, if, if we were talking in relationship terms, we figured, I think this would be like our second date, but our first date in public. We've only recently met and we're super excited to have you join our first, our first Crestbeady event. I said to Aaron earlier, this is the moment we decide if we get frisky or not. So <laughs> and with that being said, this is a very, um, I will be very loud and fun and try to make this as light and professional as possible. Uh, I am Alessandra Torresani. I am an actress and now a full-fledged mental health advocate. I was diagnosed with bipolar one disorder a little over 10 years ago when I actually was living in Vancouver at the time doing a show um, called Caprica, which was the prequel to Battlestar Galactica. And I was told to completely keep it quiet, to not talk about it as I'd be labeled as a diva or difficult. And it's not good to mention that you have mental health problems. Uh, and then I went to a conference and met these incredible people in the mental health space and finally thought, I am tired of keeping this inside. I feel like even if no one listens to me, I'm going to just start telling my story all the time and just let it go and get it off my chest because I was so tired of people labeling me as crazy or she's unstable, not knowing that there actually was a true uh, mental health diagnosis behind it. Uh, so this is me. I'm bipolar. I started a podcast called Emotional Support, in which I share all my Looney Tune bipolar stories, and I interview celebrities and mental health experts and doctors, and we answer listener questions. So always be sure to write in and uh, yeah. And so I'm so excited to be here. And one of the guys, Ross Ingram, who introduced me to Aaron, actually was one of the first people who helped me come up with the idea for the podcast. So this is all such a full circle moment. I'm so excited. Oh, he was like a matchmaker, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, this is wonderful. I want to tell you a little bit about why we focus on resiliency for, for this event. Um, you know, looking back through last year, we had topics on finances, on stress, on anxiety management, um, you know, on uh, the difficulties, the very real difficulties that people were, were experiencing during the pandemic. But during those events, we kept also hearing these stories of strength, of um, people uh, facing adversity and hardships in very creative ways. And we really thought we wanted to start this new year off with a reflection piece on that. And I want to position this very importantly by saying um, this is not to the detriment of the losses that many of us have experienced over the last year. Um, they are very real, very profound, and they're ongoing. And so I sort of want to position that reality. Um, but we thought that it was a good time this year to really kind of go into the new year looking at what's worked for us, um, what's worked for people with bipolar disorder over the last year, uh, what worked for you personally, Victoria, and for you, Alessandra, but then also importantly, because you have such wide networks through your mental health advocacy, I'd also love for you to share as well about some of the sort of themes and meta messages and what you've been hearing from your communities about what's been working for them, so we can begin to open up a dialogue space around this. Um, so with that, we're going to talk for sort of 20 or 30 minutes and then go into audience questions and answers, but I'll pass over to the two of you. Thanks, Erin. Well, Victoria, are you ready to start? Because I don't know what makes me resilient. So this is all on you right now. Oh, great. No pressure. Um, yeah, I was thinking about sort of what was the one of the first things that I know that sort of um, uh, started to get a little bit wobbly. And for me, it was finances because uh, as mm. a speaker at conferences, my business sort of collapsed. And I heard a lot about that from other people that have 
mental health uh, issues in general and people who don't, but who, because of the financial pressure, um, had way more anxiety, depression, things like that. So one of the things I think um, has been really finding a way to create some financial stability. I really feel like self-care, that, that lingo, it's not about bubble baths. It's about these really foundational parts of our life. And uh, I have always seen that financial health really uh, is equal. It's sort of um, in equal proportion to mental health. So when my financial health is faltering, my mental health is often faltering too. So here in Canada, um, I was, I think we're really fortunate. We had uh, our government, it's probably the first time I've ever said that I really am grateful for the government and thrilled with what they did. Um, but they had a lot of um, opportunities to, uh, they had a thing called CERB where you could apply for um, money for people who were really impacted hard. Um, and that got me by, got my husband and me by. And I think that did for a lot of people. I don't know about for yourself, if that's what you've been hearing. I know um, it, it's something that's certainly um, been a common theme. I mean, what's finance in the United States? We don't have that right now. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, that is just, uh, that has been a problem, I think, for a really long time, even pre-pandemic. And that is something that I constantly hear about, uh, especially from people who have mental health issues such as us, right, where people don't understand mental health really well in the US. I can't speak for, for Canada, but I know here people are very judgmental. Uh, and, you know, I always say if someone has cancer, there's a, a job is more likely to say, please take this time, take care of yourself. If there's any sort of an emergency, please, please, you know, but if you talk about that, you're having a mental breakdown and you have to check yourself into a hospital because you have suicidal tendencies and you don't know what you're going to do and you don't trust yourself. So you're getting the help th there's a lot of judgment there. And so I find that I hear a lot of people writing in or um, listeners with the questions of how can we change that language? How can we change it where it is normalized and beyond just stigma free that, that people are aware of this and letting people just live their true authentic self and being yeah. proud of them and giving support and doing all they can to help out uh, with their steps that they need to do to be themselves, not even a better yeah. person, just feel like themselves again. Yeah. And I know that you and I have talked about this. I mean, obviously actors, what's the job? Like, I don't have a job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like that's okay. <laughs> um, but it's all about figuring out what you want to do with your life and really taking that moment to step back and, I think I have been more ambitious and less ambitious, if that makes sense, to the like two extremes in um, in quarantine like this. It's kind of I've had this moment of at the beginning for the first you know month, I was like, I'm going to work out all the time. I'm feeling amazing. <laughs> like, I'm going to be a realtor. I'm going to learn a new language. And then I hit <laughs> such a state of downfall that I couldn't even get out of bed. And I hadn't felt that way since before I was on medication and I kind of was like, well, what do I do? Uh, you know, and, and it was what, and then the fear kicked in of, well, shit, I don't have a job. Like, when am I ever going to get a job? Is acting ever going to be the same? I've been doing this since I was nine years old. I'm not college educated. Where do I go from here? So it kind of pushed me in the direction of, well, I talk a lot. I have this podcast. People are writing me all the time to ask for, for help. I'm not a, you know, a professional, but I can share my experience of what I'm going through. And really, why don't I just try as much as I can to change, especially with my podcast, the, 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 the direction of the podcast where I went from interviewing celebrities to then really interviewing people who have the tools to help, because I think that is what we've all lacked especially in the U.S., is there's no tools. It's the lack of therapy. It's the well, lack it's, of communication. It's the, the lack of accessibility. And even in Canada, mm -hmm. I mean, people, the first line of defense usually is medication. And that's not always available, I know, in the States for people. Um, but even if it is, that's only half of the equation, if that, yeah. maybe a third of it for recovery. And it what you said really um, uh, rang true for me around, um, you know, feeling 
as bad as before you were diagnosed. So I, I learned that I cannot take my um, mental health recovery for granted. Like I've been, I'd been living well for it for almost two decades. And then I got hit harder than I'd ever bef mm -hmm. have before with anxiety, not so much depression, not really mania, but the anxiety. And it was unrelenting. And I doubled down on my wellness tools. You know, I was meditating and mindful and mm -hmm. exercising and, you know, in, in social contacting and it just stuck around. And so, uh, what I found really, it was that accessibility to outside help. I had, mm -hmm. I have a great psychiatrist. I know that might be an oxymoron for some of you out there, <laughs> but it's a good one. Um, I have a counselor um, and it's, uh, I have it through our um, mental health and addictions um, sort of part of our health authority. So it's, it's paid for, it's covered. Both of those are paid for. And I have my medication and then I have my sort of wellness box of tools that I do on my own exercise and friends and husband, mm -hmm. you know, my supportive husband and stuff. Um, but those other things, those sort of more health professional things aren't accessible to a lot of people. And so I think a lot of what you're doing and what I, I see um, people doing is bringing to the forefront, particularly through um, the internet, online tools or tools just for discussion and support because one of the things that I've seen and I and I've experienced it is this peer support where it's other people mm -hmm. sharing their stories um, and what works for them and troubleshooting and it's I mean the 12 steps is based on it I mean that's it's the whole thing about if you've been there done that you can help somebody else um, so in lieu of any kind of uh, until we get more accessible treatment um, I think that's one of the only ways. And I think it's one of the ways to actually remove uh, and change the conversation around, mm -hmm. you know, who gets mental illness and how well can you get? Um, because then you start to talk to people who are living um, very well with it. Yeah. Uh, so I'll say yeah. this much. I'm so happy to be bipolar and have figured this out a long time ago <laughs> because so many of my friends did not know what anxiety was, did not know what a panic attack was. And I'm like, good luck with that. I've been living with this for, you know, my whole life, you know, but I will say, and I'm sure people out there who are going to listen to this conversation will relate to this is I had so many family and so many friends, you know, reach out to me and really ask the help or ask for doctors or ask for, you know, resources. And it's not that they never not believe that I was bipolar or how serious mental health was, but they could never understand it because they didn't have this issue. Right. And they, yeah. they labeled it a certain way and then everything kind of hit the fan and they were like, Oh, wow, this is a real thing. You're Whoa, this is what you've been living with. And I'm like, yeah, yeah but I'm doing great. You know, yeah, good luck yeah. with your journey. Um, but you know, I mean, really, no, I know, but no, no, I get, and that's the same thing is that because I had wellness tools in place, my recovery period was much shorter. It was much less like the, the symptoms didn't last as long. They weren't as intense for as long. Totally. Um, and so people who never experienced mental health issues didn't have anything, you know, it was, it was completely new. And, um, and so I think that's in some ways why I feel like as much as I've had such horrible experiences with bipolar disorder, it's put me in a better place. And I think that's for a lot of us, like I've heard mm -hmm. from other people who, because of their illness and the coping tools they have, they haven't been sort of blindsided. Um, they weren't surprised that they were more anxious and then they didn't have to scramble to do other things to find out what they needed to do. So, yeah. And I feel like even for myself, you know, you bring up the 12 step program and, and I have a lot of family that are, you know, um, part of AA and, and, you know, are, are fully fledged into that. And I completely believe in that. And I'm always on their support team and doing as much as I can, but I could never understand myself going through that. I also could never, I, I wasn't, so, I don't do well in group settings, um, you know, because I feel like I talk so much and then I'm like, oh, it's not my turn. Um, but, 
<laughs> I know there's but, no crosstalk. Wh- what? <laughs> no cross, especially on Zoom, right? Because you can see the like little thing and you're like, uh, I'm here. Um, but that being said, I had a, a friend that started this group pre uh, COVID called um, space movement. And she had, she was, bi- she's bipolar as well. And she's been through hospitals and all this stuff. And she said, I never, I, she went to AA, she went to NA, she went to all these things, but she never felt peer support in regards to mental health. And, you know, she had been part of, you know, chats and stuff like this. So in Los Angeles, she said, I'm going to do a once a week meetup. If people want to come, they can come. It's very much like AA. Um, and we just speak on our mental health and our emotions, our emotional health, wow. with like, which yeah. I think is super important. And it kind of turned into this thing where it started to be online on Zoom. Yeah. And then we started sharing the message and people from Germany came and Canada came and all over the I US. Want to come. That sounds so great. Please come. It's every Tuesday. We can put it in. But I, it was interesting because I never thought I could relate to that. And I spoke at a few of the one in LA and I, I, I love what she did and I was in full support but I never felt connected to it. And now I can't miss a Tuesday because I never realized how much hearing someone else's story or hearing, you know, a a wonderful boy spoke about how his father was bipolar and to hear it on his side of what he goes through and how it wasn't that it was physical abuse, but the mental like abuse of, of when you're in a state of mania and you're attacking and you're on it, on it, on it, you never hear from my mom's point of view, what it was like. So to hear this, it really made me take a step back and appreciate my mother, appreciate my husband, because I'm on medication, but I am still like manic and have my moments and throw my phone yeah. against the wall and hit my head against the, you know, the wall. I mean, that I don't think goes away. So to hear it from other people's point of view, I think was the most, um, the, the most incredible thing for me of finding the resiliency of, of being like, oh, wow, I'm not alone. I can yeah. get through this. And that helped me kick me in the ass, you know, to be yeah. like, okay, I, I can do this. I can survive. Well, cause it's, it's like the, the strength of the group and, you know, mm-hmm. and when they started to say, you know, oh, we're in this together or we're in different boats, but in the same storm. And it became really trite. Um, but then when you really get to a group where, you know, they're speaking your language and they're my people, mm-hmm. um, to me, it's, it, it's an ama- it's a really amazing feeling. Um, and I don't know how, you know, I, I don't know the, the dynamics. I mean, it makes sense, but there's something, it's like when I, if I'm speaking at a conference and the audience is particularly like, it's really interesting if the audience is sort of not a, uh, not the choir, right. Not the mental health field. Um, yeah. there's attention and there's engagement. It's a different kind of engagement. Mm-hmm. They don't laugh at the same jokes. They don't laugh at the inside jokes. If it's a healthcare audience. You mean they didn't think it's funny that you ran through the street naked? Because I think that's the best thing that's ever (laughs) happened in my life. (laughs) I know. I know. I know. Looking for God. I mean, who would like that? Anyway. (laughs) And so, and then, but when it's, uh, let's say uh, people who have uh, mental illness or healthcare providers, there is such a comfort, right? And it's yeah. just like everybody's going, oh my God, yeah, recognize that. Oh yeah, the hospital gowns. Oh yeah, the bare ass, mm-hmm. all that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. And, um, and, and I think that's part of it is that with COVID, because our social contact has to have been completely decreased uh, or eliminated, we have to find, to me, it's not even sort of, contact with friends it's the quality of contact and so it's those meaningful conversations those authentic ones so I have a girlfriend who I go for a walk with I try once a week or every couple weeks and it's part of my mental health uh, Mm -hmm. you know regime if I Mm -hmm. because we make each other laugh we talk about you know we go deep you know all that kind of stuff and um, if I go too long without um, having one of those kinds of conversations you feel with that my friend, I start to feel uh, lonely, which is, oops, sorry, lonely, which is part of my uh, warning sign and mm-hmm. red flag that I might be going into a depression or anxiety might be um, uh, raising its head. 
So, you know, it's so funny. There's this thing that I got invited to. It's called Clubhouse. It's still in like beta or something, but it's um, yeah. it's a, a, an app, basically a talk app instead of writing. But I, I didn't understand it. People were talking about how to make six figures in marketing. And I'm like, what's that? I don't know. Um, but I started one called Emotion Emotional Support. And it was called, men it, or it is, I still do it. It's called mental health story time. And everyone kind of just comes on and shares their story. Like, you know, being in the program of just listening to this support. And I have another one on Sunday called, how are you really? Because that's a oh, question that's that great. people don't talk about. No, and one no. of the subjects. Or they don't want to hear, right? Or they don't want to <laughs> hear it. Know yeah. And it's great because no one sees your face on this app. No one sees anything but a picture you don't even have to have it a picture of you and you just share your story. And I always start the conversation of, you know, beyond the, how are you really with the mental health story time? I created this place and this trusted space and this, this safe environment, because as close as I am to my friends and I have best friends and they know everything about me, it's very hard for me to open up and be like, oh, hey, I punched a mirror and I broke a mirror today because it's embarrassing, yeah. right? Yeah. But if I share it with someone who doesn't know who I am, I mean, they know who I am, but like they Google, yeah. but if they don't, <laughs> it, there's no there's no judgment because they're yeah. sharing stories about, you know, uh, it's, it's sexual like the, the, abuse the, and yeah. anxiety yeah. and stress and financial stress and all this stuff. And it's, I've, and I started crying on one of them. And I said, this is so strange because I've never been so open to a group of strangers before and yeah. felt like they were giving me a hug and I had no yeah. idea who any of them were. Yeah, yeah, I know. And and I think that word uh, safety and trust, I, I feel like because there's so much uncertainty right now, that is one of the tools that I've heard people needing. I mean, it's not a tool, but it's what people have to build up and finding yeah. it where they can. And because yeah. I was going to ask you, like, what are some of the things you do on a daily basis to stay well? Uh, it sounds like you take medication, but there's got to be other things too, right? Who said I'm well? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, as well as you can be, right? Like, uncrazy, oh, definitely but less crazy. medication. You know, I'm on uh, lamictal, which is a bipolar medication. If I'm if I'm off an hour on it, I can tell in my body. I get yeah. this weird like tingle, um, and not a good one. Like it's really awkward. Um, and you know talking and having conversation, making sure I have a routine. I'm someone that eats the same lunch every day, the same dinner almost every day. Like I yeah. need to have routine. I, yeah. I, that is what keeps me sane, you know, and yeah. if something is messed up and, and, you know, we're late, I can never be late. Like there's certain things that I do, but the tool that I found the most, which I never was, um, not even a journaler, but just writing down thoughts. I have a thousand sticky notes everywhere and I never was that person. And actually just writing down, you know, whether it be something to do or a, a thought that came to me in regards to this conversation, just something, just getting it out, putting it out to the universe, I think has helped yeah. me to clear my mind and not live inside this all day yeah. long. Yeah. 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 And I found that tr true, like, especially uh, the first few months of the pandemic for me, where my anxiety was just like, it was physical as well as uh, mental. And it, I really appreciated my psychiatrist saying this because I felt, I felt like a failure because I couldn't, I, what I was doing was not alleviating mm -hmm. the symptoms. And, you know, it, it, if somebody was, you know, dealing with uh, back pain and they were doing all they could exercises and, you know, heating pad and ice or whatever, they wouldn't blame themselves for mm -hmm. the pain. Um, and so anyway, but what he had said to me, he said, well, at this point right now, you're at, you have a biological barrier. And so it wouldn't matter how much I did. It's just that the intensity and severity of the symptoms can't be tapped. And that's like when I first was diagnosed, I wanted to do everything natural, all the new age stuff. I wanted to use lavender. I wanted to use, you know, all the, the flower remedies. Juju. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that would work if it was, maybe it would work if it was really, really mild symptoms, but I was full blown 
psychotic, rapid cycling, all that kind of stuff, mixed state. So I needed the, the big guns. And so yeah. I, so I really felt that, uh, with, with this anxiety, it was finding that, um, place where I could, uh, find the medication that worked for me and then continue to do the tools that I know mm -hmm. support that. And, uh, and that's, and, and eventually, you know, that's what started to shift and it was talking, right. Uh, for me, a combination of, uh, therapy, because I, like you living in my head, increased the anxiety because it was all about thoughts, right. And mm -hmm. they just exacerbated how I felt. And so for me, I don't, um, I did a, uh, a, a blog on it about, uh, act, which is a acceptance commitment therapy. And so it's all about this being not having to change how you feel or change how you're thinking, but learning to expand and create enough space and acceptance for it so that it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. And then you take action in the direction of your values. And yeah. that just, that freed me. That really, really freed me. It didn't mean that I was feeling better necessarily, but it meant that I could get on with my life. And that yeah. was really important. I, I feel like Aaron's like, let's get go. on with this conversation. I know, I know. <laughs> you could you could just go for two or three hours and you would still yeah. be going. This is just this is <laughs> wonderful. And you wouldn't be aware of this because you're not like monitoring the chat on Zoom or anything, but this is this beautiful kind of tandem conversation going on online where people are sharing mostly about therapy, what's worked for them, different types of therapy, how to access treatment. Um, so it's just a lovely conversation space that's opened up. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about very briefly, Alessandra, when you were talking about how important routine is for you, eating lunch at the same time each day, somebody online was mentioning that uh, they had tried something called interpersonal and social rhythm therapy, which is basically a blend of a classic kind of interpersonal therapy, but with routine, recognizing that especially yeah. for bipolar disorder, those tethers to routine are really important. That might be exercise, it's certainly sleep, mm -hmm. but the small things that we do every day are, are really important. Um, can we get to some questions though? Because they're coming through yeah. thick and fast. So um, I'd, I'd love to dive into those. Um, and the first one I wanted to kind of touch base on is, um, is, is speaking to something that came up quite a bit in your introductions, which was around, um, is around stigma. Um, when you were talking at the beginning, Alessandra, it was uh, it really, I was thinking about this very early research study we did in bipolar disorders, which was looking at uh, self-stigma and people's decisions around disclosure. And there was this one woman who was talking about her child being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And I still remember the quote now. She said, um, if my child had leukemia, you'd all be bringing me lasagna. And speaking it's so that, true. Right, the difference between still, to a certain extent, yeah. the way we treat bi biological or non-mental health conditions and the way those are dealt with in society is uh, so profound. So this question is, is about stigma. Uh, this person says, um, feeling judged for having bipolar disorder makes me uncomfortable when I'm well. Um, when I am well, which is 99% of the time, I don't have any symptoms, but those people who do, do, who do know my diagnosis treat me like I'm disabled like I need special mm -hmm. treatment. Do you have any advice for me? Uh, I, I always say F off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's pretty simple. I was in an abusive relationship because the guy would always say to me, oh, well, you're crazy. You're bipolar. I read that he was having an affair with me and I read um, on my computer, he left the computer open and wrote to a girl and said, well, I ended it with her. That's what you get with being someone who's bipolar and all kinds of st fun stuff like that. You know, uh, I just say if they're not supportive of you and they, they are treating you like you're cuckoo, then they're cuckoo because they should love you for who you are and not be judgmental. And, um, you know, it's really hard. I think if it's family that's saying that, uh, but at some point, um, I, I speak for myself, like I have no relationship with my father because he was bipolar and wouldn't admit it. And sometimes you just have to step away and be selfish and care about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely concur with that. It's, it's about boundaries and self-care and it's, uh, I think there's a grieving process. There certainly was for me around who I needed to let go of in my life, who I needed to be. I had to be honest with myself of who I needed to let go of um, and then have the courage to do it. 
Um, and then if it was family or people that I knew that I would be in contact with, it was really learning to just not take the bait, you know, and that took practice. And part of that practice was surrounding myself with enough people who gave me the positive reinforcement that I needed that would drown out all the ugly stink eye mm -hmm. stares and judgments and coughs and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, and I think it is a practice. I think it takes time in, as I got more comfortable with my own illness and managing it, the less those comments bothered me. Mm -hmm. We produced a video on that, Victoria. Do you remember it was the relationships video where you actually had to let, you demoed letting a friend go, right? Yeah, maybe yeah. We, can, yeah. we can pop that into the chat so people yeah, can I remember connect. that. just remember that. Okay, um, lots of questions about treatment access. So a very uh, concrete one for you, Victoria, to start. Um, somebody's wanted to know how 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 do you access free counseling? How did you oh. go about that specifically? Yeah, it depends on where you live, but there should be um, sort of your uh, mental health and addictions team. Aaron, you know about it on the Sunshine Coast. I don't. It's usually part of the health authority, mm -hmm. and uh, you can be you can self refer. Uh, or you can get your doctor um, to refer you. For a psychiatrist, you need to be referred by your doctor. And so the difference between the counseling and the psychiatrist, um, psychiatrist can prescribe medication. They usually don't do therapy or counseling. I've been fortunate where I've had uh, two really um, that did exceptional therapy. Um, but uh, the counseling I've accessed is through our provincial mental health and addictions center. And uh, you can, I don't know where, do you know where you would Google or where you'd access the uh, contact information for that, Erin? I don't have it at my fingertips, but we can provide it um, to the audience afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. And it could, and if you're not in BC, it, it would be provincially and they, most of them I know have some kind of um, counseling services. They may be short term, um, but sometimes short term is better than no term at all. Mm -hmm. Another oh, question and before, oh, sorry, sorry, and before I forget, also there's um, some uh, counseling places uh, that you can um, sort of Google, you know, uh, counseling sliding scale, and you may uh, find that there's a sliding scale, like there's family services of um, British Columbia and Vancouver uh, that have, I think, a sliding scale uh, from $20 up to their regular fee. And it depends on who you work with, if it's a student that's under supervision versus uh, someone that's sort of um, fully um, certified. So those are some options, uh, and, uh, but they are, it's hard to find sometimes. Just uh, for those of you who are on the line, uh, one of the things we wanted to mention to you during this event was um, we're really keen um, to build knowledge from um, our top BD participants, if you feel comfortable doing this, obviously it's anonymous, on what's kept you well or supported your own resiliency um, over the past sort of 12 months or so. So if you would like to contribute, um, if you can drop one or two words, either into Facebook or into the Zoom chat, that kind of summarize, um, it, your maintenance strategies or what's worked for you, that'd be wonderful. The way we're gonna use this information is um, we are hoping to do a symposium with the world's biggest bipolar conference in May. And um, we're gonna be doing a variety of surveys and consultations with people around their own wellness strategies and resilience strategies. So we can share it with the clinicians and the psychiatrists at that event. Okay, thanks for showing that slide, Hayden. Uh, there was another question about treatment that we didn't get to, which was, um, really focusing on why intervention and treatment access is often so tied closely with crisis. It's much, much harder for people often to get support when they're doing well, which is kind of ironic in many ways, because you want to sustain that wellness, but it's, you know, easier to access treatment when people are in crisis. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> you can you, re can you reframe the, can you reframe the question again? I was reading someone's thing and I was like, oh my God, wait, I really agree. <laughs> Specifically, the question is, um, uh, how do you maintain resiliency when the only kind of support you can get is when you're in crisis? Oh God. And it feels how exhausting because they feel like they're beginning right at the beginning every time they go through this. <laughs> you know, I just, 
I'm lucky to to live with a guy that uh, helps me out uh, a lot of the time. And, you know, I, I, I never was someone that went hiking. That seems to help kind of clear my mind up. Um, but, you know, hearing other people's stories, like I said, is really what gets me to be resilient and go, okay, well, you know what? I'm not the only one going through this. Uh, I listen to other people's stories of how they've, you know, gotten their feedback, you know, up and, and go, I don't think that's the saying, but yes, but, um, they've gotten off the ground and, and I, I kind of, you know, take a little bit of everything of what, everyone says to try to figure out how to be the most resilient I possibly can. That's why I'm reading all of these. I'm like, Oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. You know? Shall I move on to the next question, Victoria? Sure. Go right. Yeah. Ahead. We've got two questions about parents. Let's talk about parents. The first oh, one goodness. is around somebody whose relationship with their parents has kind of disintegrated. They're in the early thirties. They feel like they don't necessarily need the relationship. But then at the same time, they're saying, you know, how do I approach this issue of my bipolar disorder with them, which they haven't accepted if I want to. So they're obviously thinking about, you know, maybe having that conversation. And I'll give you the other question at the, uh, at the same time, which is how do you cope with feeling like your parents are worsening your mental health, but you're financially reliant on them at the same time? Oh Good God, question. have I been Those there? Questions. Remember, you've wow. got, we have like eight minutes left of this piece at this point. <laughs> I'll go real fast. Uh, I stopped talking to my father because he didn't understand what mental health was and kept calling me crazy when he was bipolar. I was very blessed to have a mother that went over and above she could to try to find a cure for me or whatever tools that I needed uh, from childhood on of figuring out my diagnosis. Uh, but you know, if, if your parents are paying for your way, try to take that money and, and save it up and put a little bit into the bank to, to be able to peace out when you can, but find other outlets and know that they probably have their own issues going on. And that that is why they're looking at a mirror and not wanting to see their failure or see themselves in the mirror. So that's what I would say is just find other people and just know like, okay, don't, don't pay attention to them. They're, they're looking and going, oh, wait, we messed this up in their head, you know, they have their own insecurities. Yeah. Yeah. I would, um, I, my mom has bipolar disorder and anxiety and my dad was undiagnosed. So I, in my thirties, I was exactly in that same place where it was worsening my symptoms. I, even though they, they were very accepting of my illness, their relationship was so toxic that I could barely stay in the room. Like the energy was so awful. Um, and so uh, if you're not dependent on them, then for me, it was really giving myself space. I didn't completely cut them out of my life, but I knew that I needed to create new boundaries. And part of that was, you know, as I was, you know, adulting, we didn't have that verb back then, but, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then I probably, if around that, um, if you are dependent on them financially, and for a while I was, I moved back home and I was on sort of welfare. And so I, I couldn't get away. Um, some of the things that I found really helped, um, surprisingly was reading, really finding books and information so that somehow it made me more objective about what was driving my parents' behavior. And so I didn't quite, I learned how, I just would have aha moments and I, and I, and I was able to take it less personally. Um, and that's where I needed to find friends that I could talk to and commiserate, right? And so that, that, um, that was sort of some of my strategy. Good responses, thank you. You wanna talk about relationships a bit? There's a question here about um, at what point do you tell your intimate partner that you live with bipolar disorder? What happens if they see your meds before you've told them and you just get- I love this anyway? question. I answer this question all the time. The second sentence out of my mouth to my husband was, oh, by the way, I'm bipolar. And if this is something that you still wanna get involved with, great. If not, let's not waste time because I'd waited for so long in relationships and I was so scared. And then it was always, I was always turned. Um, it was always used against me as the excuse, uh, even response? though when it was, what was his response? He was like, 
all right, cool. Let's do this. <laughs> Yeah, he yeah. was not he, he had his own issues. He was not phased. Um, but I think <laughs> that that is something that you should be open and honest about from the beginning, in my opinion, because otherwise you're going to build it up so much in your head. Like, oh, my God, I, I like this person so much. But what if this and what if that? It's like, just, you know, let them know. And if they don't like it, then they're not for you. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, and it, I told my my husband now husband probably on the second date and I said you know same things like da, 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 da. oh and I want to mention I have bipolar disorder <laughs> and he said you mean like a mental illness you know and I was bracing for oh god this is not going well and he said oh you don't look crazy <laughs> so I was like okay that's that's better than I thought Success. and he said you take me I know. And he was curious, right? He said, do you take meds? And I said, yes. And he said, really, you don't seem to need them. And I said, that's why I'm taking them. And, uh, and so it, that was a really positive uh, experience. And I think one of the things that I find is that it was when I was well, when I was, when I was well, and I dated, that was, it would made it easier to disclose if I was really struggling still with depression or anxiety, um, it was really hard to sort of be upfront with that. So part of it was really taking care, taking a num a couple of years to really get well, feel like I knew how to manage things, um, and not feel so self conscious about talking about it. And that made a, a big difference. I think we've got some specific resources on disclosure on the Bipolar Wellness Center, right, Victoria, that we put together so we can link in people yeah. in the audience to those afterwards. Should we yeah. take one more question, do you think, at this point? Uh, this was a, um, a question early on that I really wanted to get to. Um, um, the hardest part of being resilient with bipolar disorder for me is taking the meds while I'm well because the side effects affect my daily life. I'm afraid of relapse, um, but I'm always tempted to skip medications when I'm when I'm doing okay is that something that totally you? yeah I mean I always want to get off when I feel great <laughs> and that is the whenever I feel good and go well maybe I should get off is exactly why I should stay on and why you should stay on but I mean I don't know if for for you Victoria but for me I've been lucky enough not to have any side effects on this specific medication. And I know that my friends who are professionals always say to me, you know, if there's any like really bad side effect, you need to go to the doctor and, and see what the problem is because there might be something going on. So my only advice from like another professional point of view is they always say to me, if you're feeling something that feels off or you're sleeping too much, or, you know, you have a rash or whatever it may be, maybe go to the doctor and, and really tell them specifically what, you know, the, the symptoms that you're having and maybe they can adjust it or something. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that like, cause I'm too, I'm really lucky. I don't, I don't have any side effects from the medication. So it makes it really easy to like the costs and benefits, the benefits totally outweigh it. Um, and I say the same thing that um, sometimes if you're on the wrong meds or the wrong amount of meds, um, and the hard thing sometimes is advocating for yourself because doctors, you know, just want you to stay out of the hospital. They don't always um, focus on quality of life. And so to me, it's really being able to go in and say, hey, these are the side effects and this is how it interferes with um, my wellness. Um, and is there a way that we can tweak it in some way? And I know I have a, a friend who it really has an illness that's treatment resistant. So she's tried every kind of medication and barely any of them work. And when they do, she has a lot of side effects. So it's sort of the lesser of two evils sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, staying on my meds is, it's certainly not the whole part of how I stay well, but it's like a foundational part. So I can do all the other things that sort of support it. And for me, from a clinical point of view, knowing that especially youth, who younger people who've just been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, many more are going to stop taking their medications and experiment with that. Um, and many of them end up back on medications again, but staying aligned with them and close to them through that process, not ostracizing them for that is really important. But then also giving them facts, you know, evidence-informed information, which is that, you know, we know things like 
you might be very stable and doing well on a medication for bipolar disorder and stop taking it, there's no guarantee that it's going to work for you in exactly the same way when you go back on it again. Um, so it is this constant, people often describe this cost and benefit, pros and cons, very complicated decisions around this. Yeah. Okay, let's go to a few resources and then we'll come back to you, Victoria and Alessandra at the end, just to kind of to close out our time together. Um, but I do wanna walk you through some of the things that um, we provide through Chris that might be of help to you. Um, we have a very active blog um, on our Chris BD website. We blog at least uh, once a week, people with lived experience, clinicians, researchers, and uh, this week's uh, blog was specially provided by uh, one of our long-standing peer researchers, uh, Raymond, focusing on his techniques uh, for supporting his resiliency with bipolar disorder. It's beautiful, just published today, I think, check it out. Um, Victoria is a long, long-standing blogger for Psychology Today, as well as other platforms. Uh, this one just came out at the end of last year, and there's a really nice piece on struggling with anxiety and uncertainty and ACT, Acceptance Commitment Therapy, which you mentioned earlier in today's talk, BD. You can check that out. And Alessandra's uh, podcast, which has been mentioned, um, Emotional Support, can be found in all of the usual places that you would expect to find high quality podcasts. Five out of five star rating, by the way, it's excellent. And then I also wanted to mention our plans for World Bipolar Day. So every year internationally, the bipolar disorders research and clinical and lived experience communities come together to uh, really sort of drive international focus on this particular condition um, and to, to address stigma and to open access to treatment and care. Um, this is our busiest day for the year for us at Crest BD. Um, as with um, previous years, we'll be running um, a Reddit AMA. AMA stands for Ask Me Anything. Uh, last year when we did this, we had about uh, uh, sort of 15 or so people, researchers, clinicians, people with bipolar disorder joining us. Um, and it was the largest AMA in history on bipolar disorder. Of course, this year we're gonna go even bigger. We're gonna run it for 48 hours. So it covers uh, World Bipolar Desert Day as it travels around the international time zones. There are going to be a very large group of uh, psychiatrists, clinicians, Alessandra, Victoria, people with lived experience, and researchers like me um, coming together to answer all your questions about bipolar disorder. And we'll be running parallel events and feeding that information into Facebook, uh, Twitter, and our website. If Reddit is not your thing, you'll be able to get that information in other ways. Uh, so please join us for that. And then just to mention for those of you who are new to the group that we provide a number of resources and supports for people with bipolar disorder. There is our Bipolar Wellness Center, which is where we put all of the uh, most evidence informed information on self-care and self-management strategies for bipolar disorder that we have. Our quality of life tool is available online and that's a specific measurement system for quality of life in bipolar disorder particularly. And then our academic website has all our research publications and the more kind of academic-y stuff. That's where you can sign up for our newsletter if email is your thing and that keeps you abreast of any opportunities for research engagement or helping get involved in our science. And then you can find past recordings of all of our Talk BD Live events through our website and through Facebook if there's some of those that pique your interest. And then finally, just at the end of this Zoom session and our time together, there will be a little like 10 second survey that pops up that gives you the opportunity to tell us what you, topics you would like us to cover in the future. And yay, we have uh, funding and support um, to do this right the way through uh, 2021. So we will be having our next talk BD towards the end of February. Um, and yeah, we're gonna be here for the, um, for the long run this year. So with that, we have a few minutes to close with you, Alessandra and Victoria, with kind of reflections, take home thoughts from our time together today. Um, I had a lot of fun. How was it for you? <laughs> I promised I wouldn't get too wild, so I hope it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> you disappointed me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just wait till the 30th. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's when the truth comes out. No, I just want to thank you, everyone, everyone, everyone at Crest BD, Victoria, Aaron, honestly, thank Ross, 
Ross Ingram for introducing us because I, I really didn't know anything about um, there being bipolar disorder specific organizations, people that um, could be here for each other and have the same exact live experience. Uh, I didn't realize that happened and support groups are amazing, but to know that there is specific resources for bipolar disorder that I can point in the direction of listeners of the show or people that I meet on clubhouse or family. And I think that it's super important that we uh, keep this message um, going. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I just, uh, I reiterate just, it's been great talking to you, Alessandra. And uh, I'm thrilled that we had a chance to, to have you in this discussion because I think you, you bring, you know, it's always great to have a different perspective and have different reach and things like that. And um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I, I'm trying to think of sort of what struck a, stuck out to me for this conversation. And I think a lot of it really was about finding our own people right? How that is because treatment can be so inaccessible and because it's often crisis driven, um, support groups online, uh, being able to find those um, chat rooms, things like that are, um, have been really essential in order to at least one share resources, share tools. And then there is something that happens when we talk about um, our stories with other people. And I think part of it is, is that certainly for me, it gives me hope. Like when I was in that really bleak place over the, and it lasted for a few months um, earlier this year, earlier last year, I really needed, I mean, cause I didn't feel like I was gonna get better actually. I was quite worried about myself. And um, it was really good to talk to people and see people who had the same experience of being really well for a while uh, or for a very long time and then getting sick again and then having recovery again and that just gave me hope and I think with hope I was more motivated to actually take some action um, so that so I'm grateful for everybody who speaks up I'm grateful for everybody who's who attends these because I think there is incredible power in in groups um, and uh, yeah makes things better there was a beautiful conversation happening and coming together of people online. So really, uh, and let's end there. Let's thank our participants uh, who've carved the time out today to focus on you know, their own mental health, but our communities more broadly. So um, thank you both so much. Uh, with that, um, stay safe, stay well, uh, join us uh, throughout the rest of the year. And um, yeah, we'll catch you next month. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Bye.